Welcome to Sports.com. I'm Michael Artsis. Thanks for joining us. We have a very distinguished guest joining us via Skype, Gene Fouguet. He was the president of the steering committee for retired players for the NFL Players Association. In addition to that, Gene played with the Dallas Cowboys and Washington Redskins, and he's familiar with labor situations in the past, including the strike of 77. Gene, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. What's going on with the labor situation right now? I know a lot of fans are sitting on the edge of their seat. They're not really sure what is going on. We hear so much in the media. In your mind, with the people you're talking to who are close to the situation and your knowledge of the situation, what exactly is going on right now? Well, this is a, a labor negotiation, uh, and, and the owners uh, have all the powers. They were the one that uh, canceled the agreement. We had an agreement that was going to run for a couple of more years, and they canceled it. Then they made a proposal to take 20% of what we were making away from the players and the retired players. So right now, I think it's just a lot of posturing. Uh, the federal mediator has called a meeting in D.C., at the mediator's office, and they've been told not to make any comments to the press. But to my knowledge, no meaningful new proposals have been made at this time. Now, Gene, supposedly they've been under mediation for the last three and a half days. It was something that a lot of people didn't think they would actually do, sit together for three and a half days. But as you said, you believe it's a lot of posturing. Is this mediation just that, just to say, hey, we did the mediation and that didn't work? Because it would seem to me that if you could get together with a mediator in the last two or three months, you could have gotten together more than one day at a time. Well, if the owners were serious, we would have had negotiations months ago, even prior to their decision to terminate the agreement. In our view, it's a hard ball play for them to test us, to test our resolve as a union, to see if we're going to stay together under duress. And their plan now is not to negotiate, but to put us under duress along with the fans in America. We're all being held hostage by the owners. So much is being made about whether the NFL it has the right to do this, uh, if you guys will go to court, if you're locked out. What do you think the legal situation and legal ramification is of this situation, being a lawyer yourself? Well, the legal alternatives are, are very clear, Michael. Right now, we've bargained away all of our rights. That's the only way the NFL can have a draft, they can limit our salaries, that they can share revenues as a legal monopoly. They all get that because we agreed to let them do it. Now that we're no longer in agreement, all bets are off the table. And I would say right now, the NFL draft indeed is in jeopardy. I don't even know if they can legally have a draft in April. Explain that, because I'm not sure I get that. Um, how is the NFL draft possibly illegal uh, going on in April if the players get locked out March 4th? We have a law in this country against monopolies that goes all the way back to Rockefeller. The NFL is a monopoly. They get together, they control prices, they control what they're going to pay players. The only way you can do that in a labor situation is through what they call a collective bargaining agreement, which we had. We, as players, agreed to uh, give away our rights, and in return, the, player, the owners would give us money. So we got money to give up rights. Now they're no longer giving us money, so we no longer will want to give up the rights. And one right was to give up our right of free agency for us to be able to decide to go to any team we want. Now in the system, once you become and qualify as a free agent, then under certain rules you can go to another team. But without the collective bargaining agreement, it would be like any other person in America in any other kind of job where you can leave one employer and go to another. Therefore, the league cannot get together and decide they will have exclusive rights on any one player. That's a, a, a monopoly, and you can't do it unless the players agree to that. And right now, we're not going to agree to that. What about the issue of the league saying that they are making, uh, doing $9 billion a year in revenue? Currently, they say they're giving 60% to the players and taking 40% of that revenue for themselves, and they're saying that's simply not enough. They need to increase that, which seems like it's one of the biggest sticking points. What do you feel is going on with that situation? Do you feel that they are accurate in what they're saying about that, or do you feel that that's not exactly the whole story? 
No, it's called greed, or it's called American business. And look, if you get uh, a position of power, you, you can uh, oppress your laborers and extract uh, things out of them that they wouldn't do normally. And, and that's all that is. Look, they make so much money. None of them get hurt. None of them bear you know any risk of lifetime injury like we do. None of them are going to limp away from the game, and they're just making so much money. They are making so much money, they won't even tell us how much they're making. So how can we really negotiate and find out what's fair? We think we take most of the risk of the game and certainly take all of the physical risk and should be compensated fairly for that. Now, what do you think are the three or four major points here in this negotiations? Well, it would be very hard to sum it up uh, in, in that regard. I mean, the owners are trying to find ways to make more money, and we would love to find ways to make more money where we wouldn't be more at risk. So two additional games, more at risk. Taking less money, uh, more at risk. So the owner, owners have not really come up with anything that would help the players. They're only coming up with things that will help them. What about the guy who says, you guys, the, the, pl the owners want two more games. The players uh, feel that they're not going to be compensated for those two more games and they're going to be put at substantially more risk. What about the guy who says, but you know what, the next, the next time a contract comes due, the guy's going to get more money than he would to play 16 games. So right there, that's out of the window. Well, I don't know if that argument is valid. I played in the league back in the 70s when we went from 14 to 16 games. In the old days, we had six preseason games, and those games were designed for us to get in shape to prepare for that grueling 14 weeks of the NFL schedule. Yeah, they've changed a lot of the rules, and they've changed the rules so smaller guys can play, you don't get clipped from behind, and that kind of thing. But the game is far from safe, and it's only a question of how much the human body can endure. We did not have the right to our own medical records until 2006. I'm sitting here today in 2011, and the NFL cannot tell me, or will not tell me, how many concussions I suffered. And that has to stop, and I think they have to start thinking about giving medical care right now when a player leaves the game he has medical for five years after that if his wife is not insured he will not be able to get a policy because of his previous injuries what about the the medical care that you guys are fighting for now um, and the medical care that guys have even playing let's talk about that first if there is a lockout march 4th what happens to the medical care for these players that they're currently under well, I'm not, uh, even though I'm an attorney, I'm not really a labor law expert, but I believe that once they decide to lock the players out, to lock all of us out, they are not required to continue funding certain things. And I believe one of the things that they will no longer be obligated to fund is the insurance for the players, their wives, and their families. So the first victims of a lockout will be the players and their families not being able to get medical treatment. So the question then becomes, can the players withstand a lockout? So many people have said no. The players will cave. That's what it seems like the owners would be betting on. Is that how you feel? Well, the owners disrespect us so much. It's no telling. Number one, the owners cannot agree among themselves. Number two, it is clear that the owners really feel that players think they're uh, lucky and, and, and forced to be playing. We have some of the smartest, most educated player leaders than we've ever had. Five years ago, many of them were new, didn't know the history of the union, didn't know how we had to fight for our rights, didn't know that owners uh, always were trying to take rights away rather than give rights to us, didn't know that the owners didn't want us to get medical treatment, didn't know that the owners didn't care about concussions. But now they know that the owners care about one thing, and they can't even agree about that, and that's money and how they should have shared among themselves. So if they can't decide on how to share among themselves, all of us players and fans are victims together. Do you see any resolution to this in the short term? No. <laughs> you couldn't have said it more simply. No, no. <laughs> they're going to test us, and they're going to test the will of the public, and they're going to test the will of Congress. And we'll see what happens, because the players are convinced that right now we're not sure we're in a fair deal. Just out of curiosity, could the players... Go play in a different league like the USFL? Yes. And, and what about the uh, owners? Could they bring in replacement players like they did in the 80s? Uh, well, they did it before. So they could technically do that? Yes. It's going to be an ugly situation if it uh, happens, a lockout see, March see, 4th. Michael, Michael, this is uncharted water. In the past, 
the players were foolish enough to strike because we couldn't get their attention. But now we've gotten a lot smarter. We can't beat them in a strike. We're just not going to settle for less than what's fair. So they have an alternative to keep paying us under the existing agreement or to lock us out. They don't want to pay us under the deal we agreed to years ago, so they're the ones that will lock us out. We're not going on strike. So, but it, still it's the same result. You're not going on strike. The players aren't going on strike, but the result is the same. Yes, yes. Well, the results are the same. It's, it's no football. Right. And it's no, no dollars in the door for the athletes. And that's what's, I mean, realistically, the owners can hold out a lot longer than the athletes can. I mean, the, right? Well, the owners will receive their television money, whether their television games play it or not. So how does this thing get resolved? When the owners uh, decide that uh, they're tired of the pressure they're getting from the public and they'll bring football back. All right. Well, uh, Gene Fuget, thank you very much for joining us from Washington, D.C. I know we're going to have you on regularly as this situation unfolds and continues to change and, and, and maneuver. Um, and we'll talk. We'll continue to talk about this. We'll have on other players here on Sports.com. You can follow us at Sports underscore Media. That's Sports underscore Media at Twitter. And you can check out our website, Sports.com. I, I want to say, Michael, that, and I hope I'm more optimistic next time. I hope so too. You don't seem that optimistic today, but I think the situation at the moment is bleak. And I think I speak for every football fan when I say I hope to see football in 2011. And I hope that the owners and the players both can resolve their differences. Well, as a former player, I'm a fan too. So I'm hoping for the best, but we're prepared for the worst. Thank you so much for joining us, Gene. We'll, and uh, thank you for having me on this great network. Thank you. Thank you. We'll catch up with you soon. Thank you for watching Sports.com. You can check us out at Sports.com, S-P-O-R-T-C-E.com. And follow us on Twitter at Sports underscore Media. We'll have a lot of shows we're bringing to you in the next few weeks that will debut on our network. And we've got a lot more. So check us out. I'm Michael Artsis. For everyone at Sports, be terrific.